All right, well, let's get started. I hope this finds all of you safe and well in these difficult times. My name is Peter Maravellis, and on behalf of City Lights Booksellers, I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that continues in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the shelter in place. We continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums throughout the month of September and into the fall. We are happy to announce that City Lights has finally reopened its doors to the public. Following, of course, San Francisco Health Department guidelines, we aim to make our reopening as safe as possible for all. So please do come down and visit. You'll be able to once again uh, browse our stacks. Our business hours are seven days a week from 12 noon to 8 p.m. We've worked very, very hard to transform the store for the age of COVID. Uh, you might notice the entrance is now on the Broadway side of the building at 271 Columbus. The original entrance is now an exit only, so we encourage everyone, please do wear face covering while visiting the store. We're trying to make our, all the efforts we can to keep things safe for everyone. So as many of you know, City Lights is a publishing house as well as a bookstore. We continue to publish in the grand tradition of Lawrence Ferlinghetti's seminal Pocket Poet series, and we continue to produce on a seasonal basis new books of poetry, fiction, literature and translation, and nonfiction informed by a progressive political outlook. Uh, we have new titles out this year from David Barsamian, from Stan Cox, uh, also the 21st Poet Laureate of the United States, Juan Philippe Herrera, and new poetry from Uchi Naduka and Sophia Dahlin. So to learn more about the books that we publish, as well as our upcoming events, please do visit our website at www.citylights.com, uh, where you can also keep up on our activities uh, on social media, if you will. Uh, we have uh, presence on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter and get updates on everything we publish, uh, as well as all our up and coming events. So. We are delighted and honored to have with us tonight, Carrie Oshnell in conversation with Kurt Anderson, uh, celebrating the launch of the new book, Milltown, Reckoning with What Remains, published by St. Martin's Press, which is a really powerful debut work. It combines memoir with expose, resulting in a, just a really beautiful hybrid work, kind of revealing the price paid by an American community due to corporate quest for power. So to quote uh, the author Ben Fountain writing about Milltown, he states, in Milltown, Carrie Arsenal probes deeply, searchingly into webs of family and community, history and science, power and commerce, and the price of loyalty to create what could be called an our town for the 21st century. Uh, John Freeman uh, writes of her work, profoundly important, tender, angry, full of respect and bewilderment. It is a complex love letter to a hometown. It's also a powerful glimpse of how corporate power, small town pride and death are intertwined in America, a vivid insight to the unbuilding of an American dream. So this is truly an exceptional work and City Lights is pleased to be hosting an event for its launch. Um, a few words to begin with about our speakers. Uh, Carrie Arsenal is a writer, a book critic, and book editor. She is a book editor at Orion Magazine and contributing editor at Lit Hub. Uh, she's also a mentor for PEN America's Prison and Justice Writing Program. Her work has appeared in Freeman's, the Boston Globe, Down East, the Paris Review, uh, the New York Review of Books, and Airmail. Uh, Milltown is her first book. So joining her in conversation is none other than Kurt Anderson. He is the author of the books Heyday and Turn of the Century and frequently writes for The New Yorker and Vanity Fair. He is host and co-creator of the Peabody award-winning public radio program Studio 360. Uh, in 2006, he founded Very Short List, an email service about culture. Uh, he was co-founder of Spy Magazine and has been a columnist and critic for The New Yorker in Time. With his wife and daughters, he makes his home in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, tonight also celebrates his recently released book, Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America, A Recent History, which has been published by Random House. So we will be posting links in the chat function with which you may purchase copies of both books. Uh, and we will be having a Q&A at the end of the program so you can post your questions and comments via the same chat function. Um, you may activate it by, a, a, there's a button located at the dashboard at the bottom of your screen. So we'll be pulling questions off of there. So uh, Carrie Arsenal. Kurt Anderson, it is a great pleasure to have you both with us here tonight. Welcome to City Lights Live. 
Thank you, Peter. Happy to be here. Uh, you know, at, at last I get to come to City Lights, even though I don't get to come to City Lights uh, for a book event. Um, uh, hello, Carrie. Hi, Kurt. I wish we were, I wish we were, Kurt and I only live a half hour from each other, but we still have to be distant here, so. Yes. Um, and I wanted to start by, by saying, you know, uh, Carrie and I both knew we had these books coming out more or less at the same time, mine in mid-August and hers in the beginning of September. And at a certain point, you know, sort of said, hey, the, you know, the, <laughs> we realized that they had some common Thing. features or, or, or purview or subject. Um, and so when Carrie said, hey, you want to, we can talk together. We can talk about your book as well as mine when at this thing at the City Lights, I said, sure. Uh, but I had no idea, I had no idea uh, how weirdly, uh, not quite Siamese twinish, but conjoined and interacting and, and uh, uh, speaking to each other, these books are until, uh, until I read your book. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, the, the, the simple way of saying it is, is you know, well, I mean, I don't know. What, what, I don't know. Yeah. Is that I, just me or did you feel that as well? No, I, I, I was, I started to read your book and I thought, oh, here's some similar things. And then I thought, oh, damn, I wish I would have read this book before I wrote my book. There were so many things I could have included. It was, it was like the, it was like the undergirding of my book. There was a lot of, you know, I was writing about this lived experience of this town and, you know, my family and going down all these sort of paths. And here you were providing all this sort of research for what I, I kind of concluded, but I didn't really, I mean, I did some light research on economics, you know, I, I have Milton Friedman in here and I have, I think Paul Volcker and a few, you know, and goddamn Reagan, who my father would always swear about, but like you, yours was like this deep dive into really helping me understand actually my own book even better. Well, and, you know? and, and, and you, since I'm, I'm, since part of my book, I mean, both of these books, in fact, are this, are, these books are both weird hybrids of, of memoir yeah. and history. Um, mine of economic and cultural history, yours of, well, yours of economic and cultural history too, as well as personal Everything. history. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, just by virtue of when you were born and writing about your life, 1967, and so you're writing about the 70s and 80s and, and, and afterwards, me too. It, it, no, it was, there's something kind of uncanny, like, you know, two people given some prompt and set off to rooms and ended up doing the same thing. But um, I was also reminded, as I read your book, a lovely uh, 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 columnist and critic in, at the Toronto Star called Heather Malik wrote a, a really nice piece about evil geniuses. And she said that it reminded her it was a police procedural about the murder of a country. Which wow. I loved. I love it. Uh, and good. reading reading Milltown, I thought, wow, this is a police procedural about the murder of a town. Really, you know. I mean, uh, uh, and then I also liked so much that both of our books are we are frank about our, you know, complicity or <laughs> well, our ignorance or our whatever, our our <laughs> own our obliviousness when we were younger. But about also the the process of of doing this, uh, of unearthing these stories and and doing the research and and uh, and and discovering things we didn't know. So anyway, uh, yeah, no, I thought I was thinking that too. I'd been a well, we said that the other day. It was like I'd been a bad witness to what, and I admit that like I had been yeah. such a bad witness to the pollution, the environmental pollution, and everything else that was going on. And and maybe you were oblivious in our way. But yeah, I think. A little bit too, yeah. Both of our books, like mine, is actually weirdly the writing of the book itself. Like you're watching and doing the same with yours. We're watching you dig through all this material and dig through history right. and dig through your personal sort of reckoning. We're both reckoning with yes. something. Mine's yes. just a subtitle. That's all. But. Yes, that's true. No, I what, what one of the thousand subtitles, uh, really? potential subtitle candidates, reckoning was in there somewhere, so they could have been identical in that way as well. That would be crazy. Um, yeah. the, the, uh, one thing that one of the threads of the history I tell about how the right hijacked our political economy That's and how the culture uh, accommodated that in so many different ways. I tell the story of how 
you know, middle class, upper middle class people like me who had, who never, you know, uh, you know, I, 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 I was doing fine, right? I graduated from college and I was doing just fine at a time when uh, working class America, manufacturing, all of it was beginning to be written off by these very people that I'm now writing this book about. But, but part of my mea culpa is, is how, uh, how I, I kind of shrugged and what are you gonna do? You know, I mean, as, as so many professional class people did at the time. And, and so here you are, uh, who, who were, you know, daughter of a paper maker uh, in this little industrial town in Maine and uh, went off to college. And, and so one of the things you say, you describe about Maine, and I never thought of it before, having visited Maine when I was a kid on vacation, and therefore being the object of your loathing, uh, because you hate the whole vacation land thing about Maine as, it's, as the tourist industry there, that so all of these people who both live on the coast of Maine and or, and, or who visit the coast of Maine, la -di da this is beautiful, this is clean, this is wonderful, this is nature. Meanwhile, there are people like you in Rumford and Mexico, Maine, uh, whose families are barely scraping by and, and working in big, dirty, toxic, cancer-causing factories. It's, a, it's, it's, I mean, Maine is, is uh, such a perfect microcosm of what I describe in Evil Geniuses was happening, you know, on a national scale, there it is, you're it. You and Maine are it, right? Yeah, um, it's funny. First, I have to say the tourist thing, yes, the, the object of my loathing, but it's, it's part of the conundrum too that is Maine, which we briefly talked about, but that the tourists also gave us as much as they took, you know, I mean, what I, what I feel like the tourists take, it's not just like the loathing because they come and they just rip through our towns, but it was more like if they're, if they're busy on the coast and they come and they leave and everybody just comes and leaves, comes and leaves, and they think they're ha everything's happy and it's vacation land, then it sort of ignores the periphery, you know what I mean? And I feel like that, that was really the deeper object of my loathing was yeah, yeah. by not looking inland or by not thinking about it, it just kept going ignored and ignored. So by the professional class who came to visit or whatever. But, um, um, but isn't that true? I mean, I would think, and you don't talk much about this, but the, 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 you know, affluent coastal elites, um, which is a phrase obviously used about America at large, but in Maine, I mean, people who live in Portland probably don't think too much about people who live in Rumford, right? I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't think so, or at least not when I was growing up, you know, I mean, I, I guess I lived there till I was 34, I guess. So I guess I lived there as an adult. And no, really, people aren't thinking, unless they're from there and they moved to Portland, the big city, you know, I mean, that yeah. happened too. But no, it wasn't really a place. Why go? Why? Why would you go there? I mean, unless you were skiing, they would go to the ski and leave and come right. back. So so even then, yeah, there was sort of a avoidance of of sort of what was happening in those towns. And if you did go to those towns from the coast, it was just like, you know, plug your nose and go because it's right. so bad. It's just like, why would you go? You know, why would and why would you stay? And those kind of questions always came up. You know, no. Just, and until I re until I remember when the 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 novel, The Beans of Egypt, Maine, came out oh, yeah. about you know poor and working class white people in Maine. Like right. that had just like hmm, that never occurred to me before. You know, right. like oh, it's the top of Appalachia. <laughs> right. I mean, and that's, that's actually part of why I started writing this book. My, you know, my husband was in the Coast Guard for 24 years and we moved a lot. One place we lived was in Oakland, California. Um, and people are always like, where are you from? And I would say Maine and they go, oh, you know, I've been to Agunquit or Kennebunk or I went to camp there. And I would just be like, well, not that Maine, you know, it was always like this, this explanation. So that's why I started writing about this. This is a little bit of an explanation of what that is. So people can understand the conundrum that it is in. And what happened is in, in trying to write that explanation of Maine, like you said, it became a, more of about like the working class, the rise, including my family who started the mill in 1901 to the collapse, which is basically happened like you, you wrote about in the last 40, 50 years. Yeah. 
so weird that we wrote about that same time period. I mean, yeah. And was it, was it, uh, you know, again, my, the, my, you know, I lived through it, but I, I was, you know, living my life away in, in New York City. I mean, what was it, was it, uh, clear at the time that something had changed around 1980, just in terms yeah. of the self-respect and sense of future possibility? You know, I was going to say that. I, I was going to ask you about that, too, because you you said, I think you said it was like the tipping point, 1980. And it felt like that to me. Like, I went off to college. Well, then first we had a first paper, paper mill strike in 1981, and then we had right. a real a worse one in 1986, which I, this is the one I sent you the video about. But um, but during that time, we felt it. My 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 mother went back to work in 1981 because suddenly they couldn't afford. You know, to, we had five kids in our family. Suddenly, we couldn't afford to kind of do it. My father's job, the strikes. He started losing sort of the respect and loyalty and everything for the company, and therefore it was just you know. It, it just was a, a mental and an emotional sort of cleaving from the mill. And so there was these things, you know, I was young then, but I still noticed them. I really did. And then when I went to college in 1985, you know, I was like the diversity candidate, I think, in my college. Like, hey, let's get a poor kid from Maine, you know, or something. I hey, I was a diversity kid I from Nebraska. Somebody, I actually think there's somebody on this call. I think I saw somebody that went to Beloit with me on here, but it felt like that because I was just, you know, and it's funny because I've been talking to some of the, my Beloit college friends lately. They're like, where did your accent go? You know, those things, they leave, you know? So there was, I had a, I had a pretty strong main accent, um, I guess is what they tell me. But yeah, I noticed it. And, you know, especially in 85, when I went to college and I thought it, and it seemed, this is something you talk about politically. And I noticed it right away was, people seem so conservative. And here I was at this private liberal arts college and I thought, what's going on? There's just something so strange. And each time I would go back home from college, like once or twice a year, couldn't really afford to go home. I would just like linger around, loiter around college. Um, yeah, every time I'd go home, it would be worse at home and then I'd get back to college and be more conservative. I felt that tension. And then I took the semester off in 1986, which is why I was home for that second paper mill strike. And then after the strike, then it was just, you know, that really, that really um, hurt our town in so many ways, uh, emotionally, sociologically, families and, um, you know, families just stopped being friends with each other. Families broke up and it was just a lot of- Because uh, as they are called, replacement workers, scabs came in and took jobs as they do, as they, and that just broke up. Yeah, like some of our plans. best, yeah, our best, you know, my parents' best friends, like he went into work and took a guy's job. My father's like, we can never talk to him again, you know, and it's interesting too, though, now, fast forward to now, I've heard from that man's son and we've been talking and there's a whole different other side of the story, you know, his father had, wasn't educated and he was barely scraping by himself and had longed to get in the mill, but he could never get a job. And there was all kinds of things behind it. So for him to go to work, anyway, that's another whole story, but well, yeah. And it's of course a story of how the bosses and the investor class and right. owners of companies, you know, let's, let's pit these folks against each other, you know? I, I, you know I, I, and again, I was struck reading in your, in your book in Milltown about this First strike at your father's mill, the t and the mill in the, in Milltown is the is the town, right? I yeah, mean, basically, there's no separating the two thousand or, people or the identity right? of the people either. Too. Yeah, well, and and so there was this one strike in '81, and then this big, long, awful strike that broke all facts. broke so many bonds in the town in '86, and and you know, again, I was aware that unions were were you know had a had a kind of tipping point toward you know being crushed really in the 80s i i'd been aware of that but going back to do the research for this book i just hadn't realized how quickly and 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 uh it was like rapaciously and and ruthlessly this was done and how and again i remember the, the air traffic controller strike in 1981 yeah. i had just started working at time magazine my first real serious job and uh, and and oh, I remember, it. but and I also remember as I write about in the book 
that like liberals were like, yeah, those guys are asking for too much money. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. You know, I mean, they did not, it was, it was really interesting looking back that there was no, you know, kind of liberal lefty support for that air traffic control strike, which was immediately crushed by Ronald Reagan, whom they had endorsed, you know, four months earlier. And, uh, and, and okay, so I knew about that, but I didn't realize how pivotal that was. 1981, when your father started saying, Ronald Reagan, he's ruined, the, he's, he's whatever he said, he's killing the working man. Or, yeah, killing the working man. Um, but uh, I, I didn't know how boom, 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 big strike after big strike, once a year in, in mining, in paper, in all the, in meat packing, where, where as never had been done before, these big companies said, nope, we're bringing in, we're bringing in replacement workers and they're keeping their jobs and you strikers are basically out of luck. Sorry, bye. And, and that had never happened before, not because it was illegal, but because the American norms didn't allow yeah, people right. running companies to do that, right? And, and here, so I'd written about that, did that history, I have a whole chapter about it, a couple of half chapters about it, about that yeah. crushing of the unions, uh, even though I was a member of the union, of a, of a, of a newspaper guild union, eh, you know, yeah, yeah. But I, was, I was a creative person. They were never gonna do that to me. Um, I, I, it was so interesting to me to, to see, again, you as a kid, as a teenager, up close with, with, with this happening, with this, you know, hurting your family, hurting your father, hurting your, the town. It was, it, it, was, it was like, oh, here I am writing this history and here you are living I'm this. like a little case study running around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it was, you know, I, and it's funny too you say that. That was another thing that seemed to have happened at the same time that I felt like we noticed or my parents noticed and therefore I noticed it. So it was like the Democrats sort of, like by the, after the second strike, I think the Democrats seemed to accept the deconstruction of the working class. They just sort of said, all right, we're gonna move on to sort of cerebral things and like right. identity politics or whatever. Not that there was anything- And computers. Yeah, computers or whatever. It was just like very, um, they lost their democratness or something. Um, and, and you talk about that in your book too, about sort of how, you know, they were complacent slash complicit. It wasn't just the right that sort of set right. up the two part thing. You know, you said there was a strategic war, a two part strategic war about magical thinking, A, and the hijacking of our political economy on the right, but then the left had their own sort of complicity or complacency. Well, because, I mean, you know, they lost three presidential elections in a row and thought instead of, they, 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 I, they drew many wrong conclusions. One of which I think was that uh, uh, everything that, 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 that somehow an economic right wingism, a libertarianism, a, a market and big business should be deregulated and it's all about the money jack that that was somehow being ratified by Reagan's popularity as, as opposed to just other things that Reagan represented. Uh, and, and no, and the Democrats, uh, again, and I, and I, you know, I, 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 was a, I was a Gary Hart supporter. I was a, you know, all these <laughs> neoliberal Democrat supporters. And, and uh, they just, uh, and they were played, really. I mean, it wasn't that they, they, the title of my book is Evil Geniuses. They, right. they were more like, I, I call them useful idiots and that myself is, useful idiots more than evil geniuses because they just said, oh yes, we can compromise and we can find a good place in the middle while the, while the right, while the economic right was just moving to the right and just like yeah, they, yeah. They, they, you know, they, they had, they kept their eye on their prize and, and here were all these Democrats just kind of running after them uh, in, 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 in compromise. I I, you you said to me the other day, before I read it in the book, a couple of weeks ago, actually, I think, uh, that your town and, and your county was the biggest flip from having voted for Obama by huge margins, like the rest of the state of Maine, twice, 57% or something. And then even though Trump still lost Maine by three points, just tremendously won your town and your county. And, 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 and those, like, you know, went from like really almost 60 40 to 60, 40 the other way, practically. And, and, and uh, I, I, those, those places, like where you grew up and you're writing about, are, are, are really fascinate me more out of the 2016 election 
than anything else. What, what do you think that was about? Well, it was, I mean, I, I write about this in the book a, a little bit, but it was, it was about this past 40, 50 years. They had been, you know, they had to put up, they, they put up with so much um, sort of the, like you said, the, the uh, move, the mobility had been crushed, the incomes had been lowered, the manufacturing jobs were gone, then, so the jobs are gone, and then there's no unions, and they didn't feel supported, and then there was, you know, politics politics happening over here like we were just talking about but they were just like man we gotta pay the rent you know and then our mothers went back to work and then the kids started leaving home like like leaving not coming back you know not not coming back to their rural hometowns I mean it was a and then and then Milton Friedman's they I write about this in the book that that essay seemed to I had just discovered, I honestly have just discovered it. I'm not an economist. I'm not any kind of, I'm like a writer. I'm just a nosy writer. But like this essay seemed to have like ruined everything for them. You know, it, I, I read that a while ago while researching the book and it seemed like everything that filtered down, I mean, speaking of filter down, so, you know, Reagan's like, everything's going to filter down. And the only thing Trickle that filtered down, down Trickle yeah. Down. The only, the only thing that, yeah, I was going to, is that we were, we were there standing up for ourselves and that was yeah. it. We were like, nobody's there to help us. And, and, you're, so, you know, and that, that attitude started really just getting wrenched in. Yeah. And you can see how that just led to the current day, yeah. 50 years of that. Well, know? and, 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 you know, and, and this relates to the, what I think happened to national Democrats, what happened to the Democratic Party on economics, uh, which is like, the differences between Democrats and Republicans on social policy, economics, social safety net, all that stuff just ceased to be very great. I remember I always, when people started the saying, in, as they did in the 90s, especially, and then in the 2000 election, uh, oh, there's no difference between Republicans and Democrats. It would always make me so angry because of course there are gigantic differences on abortion and right. race and all kinds of things. But, but, on economics and like being the party of the working man, not so much, right? And, 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 uh, uh, well, Hillary proved that in the last election. It did, yeah, it exactly. Like, uh, um, it's like the working class. What did she know? What did you do about the working class? I don't know. <laughs> she, she, yeah. I mean, um, but, but back to the, this great flip from Obama to Trump. Yeah, yeah. I mean, which part of it, I mean, you know, one thing to conclude from that is well it's so trump is trump's popularity in the election was not all about racism look these people a third of rumford in mexico maine uh, a third of the people who had voted for obama voted for trump in 2016 so they they're, they're not so racist right but uh in that debate or whatever like so is, is the support about is it is it you screwed me you elites right is it um, you know, or is it, is it more bigotry and, 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 and xenophobia and racism or, or both, or in your experience of, of your, of your, of, of, Mex of your town? I, I would say it's, it's just a desperate attempt for some kind of change. You know, Obama, and you say this in the book, Obama sort of, I mean, he, I say, I say he had a celestial presence, but even that didn't change anything economically for them. Right. You know? um, and, and I would say about the race question, I mean, I think that the right has also, and I don't, I don't know if you address this in the book or not, but I think that the right has done more to sort of separate, um, you know, divide the working class into racial components. And, and it, so if we, that wasn't what was going on here, at least for that vote, at least in my town. I mean, here I'm writing about my family in my town, which wasn't, there wasn't like a, um, it, was, it was very economic. Um, economically based and hope based, really hope they voted for Trump because they voted for hope. Yeah. Like I say in the like I like I say he he basically uh, the limousine scene. You know we talked about that. Like even you have a it was like that that line from that Robert Kaplan book. It was um how did it go um basically it was the coming anarchy that book that Robert Kaplan wrote. Um, he said you know. Uh, some of the world's driving in limousines going through towns while the rest of the world's on the outside of the limousine or whatever. I said that really poorly, but, um, you know, Trump came through these towns and like opened the door and said, hello, where 
you right. know, Hillary Clinton came to Roxbury here where I live and had a fundraiser, you know, for like yeah. 2,500 bucks a seat in the way back, you know, she didn't go anywhere near, <laughs> you know, that was part of it too. I mean, it was, it was that, you know, like you said, all the, the loyalties, the things that, I, I mean, I just, there's something else I wanted to say too about the eighties too, that I, I wasn't, you, you covered it a little bit in the book, but the eighties was a time of real serious stress on people uh, in something I talk about in the book of environmental pollution in the 1980s. It was the dioxin scare in our yeah. town. That was like another sort of layer of, you know, uncertainty that was like hovering over everybody. So you had all these other uncertainties. You had this dioxin scare, this environmental pollution and people were worried they were already worried about their job, never mind like just dying of some crazy disease or cancer. So well, it was interesting was to me again, it was one of these other like, whoa, here's another like odd connection because in the 80s at that first job I had or big first big job I had at the Time magazine, I did a whole piece about dioxin and, 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 and these these towns destroyed by pollution, like Times Beach, Missouri, which had been destroyed right. by dioxin. dioxin. Yeah. And they tore it down and moved it away. And I went out there and and uh, oh. you know, took off, took off those shoes that I'd worn and never worn them again. And, no. and uh, but it's interesting to me, given that it was this big national environmental thing. Look what these companies have done. Oh my God, this is terrible. But it seems like your piece of Maine, like, nah. I mean, it like, yeah, a local Boston station did some documentary, but it 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 it, it seemed like. Even as this was becoming a big deal at that time in the 1980s, not not so much for you guys. For for you guys. No, it's. I mean, it has to. I, it's like anything, right? You can take climate change, for instance. It took like the West Coast burning down for people to sort of say, "Okay, it's really happening." Even the, even it's still not. I mean, it it takes like some spectacular event, and you know, Mexico, Maine, with its 2,000 people, and Rumford with its five or 7,000 people with dioxin sort of invisibly slowly killing people. Right. It's not, not really a big store, not really, it's not Love Canal, it's not Chernobyl. It's it's very slow kind of violence that's been happening over the years. And that's why, it's just not newsy enough. It's just not interesting. Times Beach, Missouri, that was, that's so interesting you worked on that. We'll have to talk yeah. about that. Um, yeah. I mean, I know writing this book, uh, I mean, I. You know, I, I'd written novels for 20 years and then I wrote this other history book called Fantasyland and then this book. And uh, especially with this one, there was so much I didn't know. I mean, I, 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 was, I was not particularly economically literate or didn't understand what, when people talk about the financializ financialization of America, what that meant and all these things that I, I you know, spent a couple of years studying. I mean, when, when you go through, uh, like get these, boxes and boxes and boxes of this abstruse chemical <laughs> pollution reports. Like, I think I just would have quit at that time or, or, or just said, well, maybe my book isn't going to be so much about the science, but you kind of, was that, that must've been sort of daunting. It happened like on a daily basis that you see that trunk behind me that's full of things I haven't looked at, but um, yeah. yeah, no, it was um, horrible. I just, that stuff is like, it's like looking at a car motor. I just, my brain shuts down. I just can't, I can't, but I just, I stuck with it. And I had some people, some really good people helping me through some of it too. An ep epimediologist who helped me a lot, a couple doctors um, try to understand it in sort of layman's terms. So that I could yeah. really understand it. So then when I read the reports, I could sort of understand them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, as long as you can explain them to, you know, other people seem like you know what you're talking about. I seem like I know enough to I know enough to not be dangerous. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. And I would check with you know I would check some of that stuff with like the real science. I would run it by certain people and say, can you just make sure I'm saying this right? You know, like right. I had a chemist. I'm like, how do I describe this? But yeah, it was um, it was infuriating because it's like trying to find something that doesn't want to be found. <laughs> Is what I it was an exercise in that, you know, dioxin, which is well, no, and that's how, how the it's tiniest. a police procedural, you yeah. know, like you're this cop on the on this cold case kind of. You're, <laughs> you're, a lot of uh, of the story is about uh, what seems to be obvious, which is that the effluents, dioxin and otherwise from this paper mill, not only took out all the oxygen and fish in the river 
Androscoggin, is that how we pronounce it? Yeah, Andrew Andrew Scoggin. Scoggin. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but killed people, caused cancer. And, and your father died of cancer, not young. He lived a long life. Um, right. it, was your father's illness and death, I mean, did that happen? Was that, how much of a motivation for digging into that part of this story? Uh, um, was, zero. Was zero, because I started this book in 2009 and he got, right. he died in 2014. So it was happening in real time. He, I was in the middle of writing the book when he got sick and died. But there's like several, there were probably like five people in my book that got sick and died that worked in the mill while I was writing it. So his, the motivation wasn't because he was sick or anything to do with him. It just happened like an unfortunate accident that happened. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you too about, I wanted, I wanted to talk a little bit about that fear and distrust of government that you suggested comes in part from a couple of things. I think you said prioritizing individualism was one thing and that departure from expert advice. I, I would really like to just yeah hear your thoughts on that because. Well, I think, I mean, there has, I mean, for better and worse, and for better a lot of the time for America, in America for the first while, couple of three centuries, I mean, this hyper-individualism and I can believe whatever I want to believe and, and I am responsible for myself and I got my gun and I'm going west, even if you didn't actually, you could, right? right? All, all of that was part of the American character. And, you know, but, but it was always, you know, especially in the 20th century with progressivism and the New Deal, there was much more of like, okay, we're all in this together and we got to create systems that make us all in it together, whether it's minimum wage or allowing unions to grow and protecting them and, and uh, overtime pay and all the, the whole web of things. Antitrust, uh, you know, enforcement against companies that were too big and too powerful, economically and politically, all that stuff that grew up and then, and then, you know, and everybody thought, you know, I, I grew up as a kid and a young man thinking, okay, that's really irreversible. I mean, there might be these course corrections, but then these, these evil geniuses came along on the right and decided to use the, you know, the, that like good old fashioned American individualism uh, yeah. and, and, and weaponize it. And just at this time, right after the late sixties in, in the seventies and eighties where nostalgia was coming back like crazy in, in the culture, in the pop culture, and saying, yeah, wasn't America good back then? You know, and, and, and when we were individual and government wasn't messing things up. And uh, uh, so again, it, it's a real thing. It's a real part of the American character, but it was always modified by these countervailing forces and, and this, you know, community versus the individual, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Egalité, fraternité, as you and your French uh, ancestors would have said. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, no, it, 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 it became twisted and exploited uh, in a way that it really never had been and, 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 and turned, mm -hmm. turned progress off, really, economic progress off, even as various kinds of cultural progress and racial progress and the rest were, were ongoing. Economically, it just stopped because of of this project that was really just anti-government to demonize government. Government is incompetent. Government is 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 you're not your friend, right, which, right. which of course had 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 welled up in all kinds of ways on the left as well as the right during the '60s, right? And in our president, yeah. So <laughs> I mean, so so it was just it was just sitting there ripe to be used, and 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 they used it. The, again, that's another thing I hadn't mentioned about the the you know, touch points between these, between yeah. evil geniuses and Milton, which is this, you know, I write a lot about nostalgia in that way and others of how it yeah. was used politically and how it kind of became the stage set soundtrack to this political hijacking, this economic yeah. hijacking. But you talk too about how, how uh, in your town, this, this reverence for the past kind of congealed into this sad, <laughs> pointless <laughs> well, nostalgia, right? Yeah, it was like, it's, it's, it's not even the reverence for the past, it's a reverence for what they thought was 
the path or that what they thought it was like, right? Uh, it's a small difference, but it's important because it, and it's funny. It just happened the other day. Somebody, there's this forum on Facebook where they're all discussing my book in my town. It's like whipping through the town like wildfire. Sorry, no, nope, I shouldn't have said that. Um, it's going through the town, but this guy said, well, I'm going to just, I choose to believe what I want about the past of our town. And I was like, that's exactly the problem. <laughs> I mean, exactly. part of the problem is too, it's, there wasn't, and I read about this and you kind of do too. Um, and I just had a conversation with Ben Fountain who writes about it too, but there really was no, the American dream was as fictional as a Horatio Alger book. I mean, Every, you know, there was a structural mobility, there was a, it was a structural mobility in the early 20th century. Everybody was moving upward on mass, right? There was a tacit buy into that system. We were all moving up. But then, you know, as you point out, it just, it just became, you know, unequal and unequal until this crazy day we're living in. But it also was, um, you know, we were also being poisoned, you know, from day one. Right worse than, you know, it was a colonial enterprise, really. Right. These, these manufacturing, they were colonial. And I feel like all these evil geniuses that you talk about, I was like, yes, I get to the end. I'm like, they just want it to be like a colonial empire again. That's basically yeah. what they're shooting for. You know, if they're just ripping all the things away that, that the, the safety, safety, whatever that we put into the system, they rip it all away. It's just going to be like a colonial empire again. Yeah. Exactly yeah. What they're doing. Well, and, and, you know, it, uh, again, one of, one of the themes of, of evil geniuses is, is, is how the, this, this sense that is useful to the powers that be that, eh, this just happened. What are you going to do? It just, it just happened. You know, not we did it, not we re-engineered everything. So this is the way the system would work after 1978, but uh, it just happened. And, and, and you talk in Milltown about uh, this, this uh, kind of Yankee working class fatalism about like, eh, you know, what are you going to do? It just happened. And it's, that's that as a, as a cultural habit or a, yeah. a default is very useful to people who, who, who you know, don't think, eh, what are you going to do? You can't really change it. There's, people are corrupt. <laughs> they're going to screw you. Right? You know, and, and, yeah, and was that, yeah. You know, and, I mean, and that's, think, the, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So. No, I, um, go, you go ahead. I was just saying, I think it was, it was like, eh, but it was more like, I think I wrote turn style of resignation because yeah. all this stuff had just been like pushing down on them, you know, over the years. And I think they got to that point where it was like, you know, just didn't have the energy. And I even talk about that. Like who has the, you know, I, all these documents are coming in and I'm trying to, find out about this environmental pollution and all this stuff, you know, who has the time to do that? You know, right. never mind. Who is it? So by the, you know, this turn style of resignation, everybody's just like, I don't have time to deal with that. I just need to go and make some money. You know, now yeah. this town is just, is really bad off. I mean, it's even worse than, than it's probably the worst it's been, you know, four to five kids are food insecure and four out of five. Four to five, yeah. Oh, four the, whole, five. the whole four out of five, yeah. Really? Huh. Every kid Although I want to say, well, before we take, go to questions and stuff, I do want to say, as, as dreary and depressing as these two stories sound, <laughs> another thing that I, that, I, that I felt like we had, in, that these books have in common is, yeah. is they are also, when, when appropriate, wry and w witty and totally yes entertaining you know so we're not just funny, we're not yeah. just gloomy gusses about this <laughs> about this apocalypse that has befallen america <laughs> it's true before we go into quest it's true it's funny everybody i promise there's a really many many humor everything you write i mean it's in there the humor is like sort of bubbling through the sentences but um one thing before we go to questions that i didn't ask you before was just about the um, the Democrats and the laissez-faire attitude that we talked about in the past, but I just I'm a little worried about it for this election. Are you? Oh, you mean complacent? Okay. Like, oh, it doesn't really matter. No, I mean, have they moved? Have they come up with some kind of new program? I mean, are they doing well, anything different than the last election? I'm not worried. I, about I, I well, there's two. I don't know if you're asking like, will Democrats be energized to vote because it's the most important election ever. Uh, as Donald Trump is also saying, by the way, uh, I, I don't think that's a problem, and I don't think some third party 
yeah, no. vain folly of voting for Jill Stein kind of thing is going to happen as much as it happened last time. Um, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful if, you know, if Joe Biden can be elected president and, and God knows if uh, the Senate can be taken, number one, by defeating your Republican uh, s senator, uh, um, uh, Susan Collins, um, uh, I, that's a first step. It's not the end of the line, but I, but I am hopeful that, like, I, I am hopeful that over the last decade that enough people, not just Democrats, also Republicans, people who voted for Donald Trump who thought he was going to fight Wall Street for the working man and all that, because that's how he campaigned in 2016. Okay. There's enough understanding of the rigged system mm -hmm. that uh, the, 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 certainly in the Democratic Party, unlike the Republican Party, which is, of course, run by evil geniuses and rich people, um, that, that it's moved left in a way that I think Joe Biden just being, you know, kind of generic Democrat uh, will, will be with his party wherever 52% of them are. And, and right, so right. I think 52% of them are now like, no, you know, fuck you, Boise Cascade. And, and, and no, let's tax rich people properly and all the rest. So I'm, I'm hopeful, but you know, it's, it's a long slog. And the other thing, again, that I learned writing this book and researching this book is that why they were so successful, these guys, yeah. is they kept their eye on the ball. Yeah. They played the long game. It wasn't- That's kind of where I'm coming from with a Democrat question. They seem like they're yeah. paying attention like that. Yeah, so. no, and that's what it just, there's a lot to learn from, you know, as I say in the book, you know, even evil geniuses are evil, but they're also geniuses. And, and they did many, many things right in, in building their institutions and playing the long game. And, and that's what the left has to do. And, and not just, you know, compromise and cower at the first. Uh, right. That's know, my concern. Yeah. Their, their default posture because they're polite. They're nice, you know. Right. Um, the right took over the, ju what is the judiciary, the lobbies, the universities you went you go through this whole like i mean it was, it was like a war with five different theaters of operation right, you know? right. and it's just it was incredible and and uh you know and 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 it happened partly because you know the the uh, the, the liberal elite just thought oh we're good. we're still in charge we're really still in charge of the culture we're you know this this isn't going to happen and and the what those of them who were doing well during the 80s and 90s like, hey, I'm doing okay. Like, what's wrong with this system? You know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, but, I, but I think lessons have been learned. I, I'm hopeful that we are at the end of this long, Thing. you know, 40 year cycle. Uh, so I, I am I'm prepared, I am hopeful and prepared to be more hopeful unless I am rendered to a pit of hopelessness, <laughs> the likes of which I have never seen before, depending on what happens uh, over the yeah. next two years. Yeah. Oh. So, I hope you're not rendered. Uh, um, well, any which way. Well, I hope I'm not. I hope I'm not put in a, you know, deter, <laughs> you know, internment camp. But um, uh, both of us, we can, we can, we can share bunks in the internment camp. I guess we can. We can write another book at the same time yeah. together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so back. since you have decent vision and can look at whatever, if yeah. any people have written questions, uh, ask, ask, tell what, tell me, tell us what they are. So I have a, a question from Steve for Kurt. What do you see as any movement to provide any intellectual foundation slash underpinning for our politics moving to the left? Well, there's this book by Kurt Anderson called Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America. That's one small attempt to have that intellectual underpinning. I joke, but that's what I was trying to do. Uh, but, but, um, you know, there's there's many of them. I mean, and there have been for years. Uh, uh, you know, the Naomi Klein's, the Thomas Franks, the Thomas Piketty, the great giant economic his econ economic books. There is there. See, that's why I'm hopeful because for the last decade, in terms of this, this kind of building of these institutions on the economic left about antitrust, about proper taxation, all of it. It, it, it was it it sort of built got built up during the last decade very very similarly to the history i write about in in the book of how the right did the same thing in the 1970s 
you know? So there was this whole decade of, of work, of intellectual spade work, really, and, and institution building, that then suddenly, kaboom, was, was visible when Ronald Reagan was like a president, became president in 1981. And, and, you know, history doesn't repeat, but I'm hopeful that in this case, you know, I am hopeful because in this case, it, it seems to me there is a whole set of, of intellectual underpinnings. I, you know, I, I mean, Andrew Yang was not my candidate in the Democratic primary, but, but the way in which he presented the future of work and, and, and how, you know, something like a universal basic income will be required to deal with the future joblessness caused by smarter and smarter machines doing all the work. That was respectably, that was, that was well explained and delivered by, his, by him and then respectfully uh, received, I thought, by the media. So, so I, I'm hopeful that there is a, a set of, you know, intellectual theoretical underpinnings in a way that there just wasn't, you know, uh, 10 yeah. years ago, right? I mean, there was almost no national economic left anywhere in the vicinity of political power. And now there is, so that's better. So Abby makes a, a comment. It's not so much a, a, a question, but maybe you can comment on it. Timothy Snyder and Jason Stanley both write about fascism. And they say that stirring up nostalgia for the past is key element of fascism, including the cult of the leader who says, quote, I am the only one who can bring us back to that glorious past, unquote. Uh, it's a great comment. And, and uh, my previous book, uh, Fantasyland, which I happen to have a copy of right here, by the way. Um, 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 I don't have my new one, unfortunately, stupidly. But in Fantasyland, I, I ended talking about that very subject and talking, and, and I had never read uh, the Hannah Arendt a book, famous book she wrote in 1950, 51, uh, called The Origins of Totalitarianism. And her talking about Hitler and Stalin and, 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 and that, that, that sort of dictatorial fascistic or Stalinist uh, uh, kind of movement of the masses. I'm telling you, I read that in 2016, and it was uh, I, I, it gave me chills as I read it because it's exactly that kind of thing. It's it's playing on nostalgia. It's it's lying and then being uh, uh, when your lies are shown out uh, or revealed, your 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 supporters are still with you because they think you were so clever to have lied and gotten away with. It. It sounds very familiar, you know, that's all I'm saying. And so we're not there yet, but, you know, uh, you know, let's not wait until we get to 1935. You know, it's, it's, we're right there on the border of 1933. The, um, also the other thing that was sort of um, shoehorned in there with that nostalgia thing, I feel like the, something I studied a lot when I was in Sweden was that, um, felt like some of that was a backlash to globalization too, or they were playing on that backlash. You know, people were losing their community and their tribe and, and people were getting really nervous. I, you know, I, I remember feeling that really sharply when we lived overseas um, and I was studying this kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think that that nostalgia, I mean, they were doing, you know, they're playing upon those fears, but it really, that was all happening around the same time. Like, totally. You know, well, and, and it's not unique to the United States. I mean, look at, 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 at the Conservative Party in England, in, in the UK, and Brexit. Look at Modi yeah, Brexit. in India. I mean, they're all playing, uh, you know, uh, on, on various kinds of nostalgia. Putin, um, yeah. Mother Russia. I mean, it is, it is, you know, fascists and dictators of various flavors. Uh, that's, that's part of the playbook. Yeah. A book for fascists. Yeah. Let's fight fascism, shall we? <laughs> the time has come. Carrie, could you read maybe just a page from the book? I really would like people to just get a sense of your prose. Oh, if you could just pick okay. a page. I'll pick a page. Good point. Yeah, my book is not um, a little different. Maybe I'll read from the preamble since it's the first page. Is that okay? Cool. Yeah, that'd be nice. All right. Um, <laughs> Oh God, I don't know, should I? All right. Mexico, Maine is a small paper mill town that lies in a valley or a river valley as we now call the area because I suppose you can't have one without the other. The hills are low and worn and carved by the water surrounding them 
and trees line the rivers, which confine the town. Coursing through the valley's midsection, the Androscoggin River, just across the S hook in the neighboring town of Rumford, the mill smokestacks poke holes in the white plumes they create. That's money coming out of those smokestacks, our fathers used to say about the rotten smelling upriver drafts that surfaced when the weather shifted. That smell loitered amid the softball games we played beneath those stacks and lingered on our father's shirt sleeves when they came home from work, allowing us to forgive the rank odor for what it provided. Where stack meets sky, the wide, slow moving Androscoggin pivots and bleeds south and east under bridges and over rapids, pushing through dams, slinking around islands and along inlets, skidding through other mill towns, picking up flotsam and jetsam or passengers and canoes. In the calmer sections, its velvety waters press on with the slow caress of lava and despair. Vapid pools form where the water has nowhere else to go, sheltering the river's secrets in dark lagoons where they congregate in the muck and fester like complicity. That's not... Yay! It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, that is about all we have time for. Uh, I kind of wish this could go on. I'm having such a great time. We can do um, it again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> in, you know, in the flesh next time. Please. And, uh, and then maybe also we can all go out for drinks afterwards. <laughs> so Yay. there's a rain check in order from City Lights. That is, uh, I'm write that down. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Kurt. And thank you all for joining us.